Good morning. What a pleasure that we all get to be together today, this Saturday, as we reflect on the life and the legacy and the power of Michael Mosier. We are glad you're with us. This is one of those moments where it's good to be together to reflect, and it's good to be together to remember and to hold grief and also to hold hope and to hold joy. You're going to hear from some beautiful people today, ways in which Michael impacted their life. We're going to hear from Susan, his wife of 50 years. We're going to hear from the kids. We're going to hear from other friends. But we want to hear from you too. And so on your screen at the bottom, there's a place where you can chat. And we invite you to write your remembrances of Michael or the Mosher family in the chat. That chat's going to be saved. Um, Susan will have that, the kids will have that, um, and it'll be a living record, so to speak, of some of the um, sentiments that we hold in our heart. Also, our service is being recorded, and you're going to find that on the LaSalle Street Church YouTube page. Uh, the link that Susan sent around uh, earlier today that got you to this place right now um, will be an active link, so you'll be able to return to this service or to pass it along to those who are not able to be here today. Thank you for being here. Let's open with a prayer before our living God. Gracious God, we are grateful for the gift of life. We're grateful for the people that we've known. And today, especially, we are grateful for the life and the legacy of Michael Mosier. As we share our reflections on him, as we share these scenes, these memories that we have, we ask that you'd knit them together and knit us together, that you would do that work that is always yours to do, that way of remembering us and filling in the pieces. We ask that this entire expression of life would also be an expression of joy and gratitude. And we pray that at the conclusion of this service that we might have a new vision for how we are to then live and for how we're to manifest your joy and your mercy and your grace in the world. All praise and honor belong to you. And it is in your name that we pray and let all God's people say, Amen. We turn the service to Susan. Hello. As Michael's wife, I would like to welcome you all today and thank you so much for coming. This was not exactly the way we had planned to do the memorial service, but after waiting a year and still not being able to gather, we thought it best to just move ahead. So thank you. I want to say a special thank you to LaSalle Street Church and to Lucas and Pastor Laura in particular for helping making this possible. A couple things I want to say about today's program. One is that uh, it is kind of a homey patchwork quilt uh, of memories taken from different people who see different sides of Michael. And uh, you will be hearing from two of his kids as far as their words, and his third child will be singing songs that were special to him. One of the songs Song of Comfort was one that we used to sing to the children at night and also um, when there had been trouble or sorrow. So the lighting in that is particularly on the dark side so that you can get the sense of the comfort that comes from the song. The other special uh, thing to mention is that um, Michael's grandson, Marcus Mosier, who is seven years old, has recorded a song in honor of his grandfather. So you'll be able to see the uh, uh, Blackbird song uh, on this also. So it will be a an enjoyable memory-making time regarding Michael. So please stay with us and enjoy the rest of the service. This is the obituary for Michael P. Mosier.
Michael Packard Mosier, 73, of Chicago, Illinois, died on Sunday, September 6, 2020, at home on hospice after a lingering illness. Michael's wife and daughter were present at bedside with him when he died. Michael was born on February 19, 1947, to Frank and Virginia Mosier. He grew up in Birmingham, Michigan, and graduated from Seoul High School. After attending a year of college, Michael joined the Army and fought in the Vietnam War. After recovering from serious injuries sustained there, Michael attended and graduated from Michigan State University, where he met his future wife, Susan. After they married, Michael attended law school at Chicago Kemp Law School and DePaul Law School and graduated with his Juris Doctorate. Michael had a keen sense for the poor and early in his legal career, he helped establish a legal aid clinic on the west side of Chicago and served for several years as executive director of that clinic. In 1985, the firm Mosier and Associates was created with the goal of serving the legal needs of charitable, religious and educational organizations throughout the Chicago area and around the country. Michael was known by his clients to be highly creative and fierce advocate on their behalf. He was also the mentor of many prominent Chicago attorneys now practicing in the field of not-for-profit law. He also regularly taught courses on the same at Northwestern University and for the Illinois Institute of Continuing Legal Education. The not-for-profit community has lost a great advocate mentor and friend. Although law was Michael's vocation in ministry, his avocation was using his boundless creativity to design and construct works of art with wood. On cruises, he would become a conversation center as he carved imaginative walking sticks. He made a cradle from the walnut scavenged from a law school renovation project. That cradle has the names of 18 infants who have had the pleasure of using it so far. Some of his other creations include a prairie style dining room table of oak, oak picture frames with inlaid walnut, Dentil style molding of walnut and oak for his renovated kitchen, and kitchen cabinets for his beloved cottage Cedar Tangle on the Bois Blanc Island, also known as Bablo to the locals. One of his predictable comments was, I could make that, and he could, and often did. His creativity extended to his love of gardening, and over the course of 33 years living in his home in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago, he reimagined and beautified the extensive property in a peaceful, into a peaceful sanctuary. Michael had a clever sense of humor and a twinkle in his eye both of which made him an entertaining teacher and companion. His cleverness extended to the ability to repair just about anything that broke. His curiosity was boundless, which resulted in his being a walking encyclopedia. He has knowledge of and an opinion about everything, commented a friend staying with us from Brazil. He also had a passion for travel and adventure, including a stint of a summer employed on a ship on the Great Lakes and another summer on an oil tanker between California and Hawaii. While there were many other special vac vacations over the years, perhaps Michael's favorite was with his wife, Susan, as they drove the Alaskan highway when it was still a dirt road, camping in the tent all the way from Michigan to the Kenai Peninsula. They even picked up a few weeks of work at the lodge in the Denali National Park in Alaska, an adventure of its own. In a joyful mood one evening several years ago, Michael and Susan constructed a list of six words, all starting with the letter C, that captured the essence of Michael's personality. Compassion, curiosity, creative, clever, constant, and curmudgeon. He loved his family, made meaningful contributions to life, and he will be deeply missed. 
Michael is survived by his wife of almost 50 years, Susan Peabody Mosier, his daughter, Laura Mosier, and Nathan Otero and their son, Zachary. Michael's son, Keith Mosier, wife, Kira, and children, Marcus and Marinus, and his son, Brian Mosier. Michael is also survived by his sister, Maddie Mosier of Aenea, and her two children, Rena and Zenny Day. His sister, Marsha Mosier, his brother, Peter Mosier, and Peter's children, Kevin, wife, LaDonda Mosier, and his daughter, Andrea, husband, Lance Cousins. His sister, Molly Mosier Foster, preceded him in death. Blackbird, sung by Marcus. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You are only waiting for this moment to arrive. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these sunken eyes and learn to see all your life. You are only waiting for this moment to be free. Blackbird fly. Blackbird fly. Into the light of the dark black night. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You're only waiting for this moment to arrive. You're only waiting for this moment to arrive. You are only waiting for this moment to arrive. Hello, my name is Hugh McGill. I'm a friend of Mike and Susan's from the 35 years that my wife and I lived in Chicago. We now live in Minnesota, but 1985, we had moved from Minnesota to Chicago and I was introduced to Michael through a mutual friend in the Christian Legal Society. Over a very long breakfast, I'm sure, I learned of Mike's upbringing, his Vietnam service and injury in the war, uh, his and Susan years of living in community, and the remarkable ministries that grew out of that commitment to community, uh, for which I hold such deep admiration. Their children, the Austin Christian Law Center, and of course, Michael's Law Practice. In the late 1980s, Michael and I actually considered practicing law together, and even to the point that we looked at some leaseholds in the loop, and we met Susan for the first time, my wife Nancy and I, and we had a number of dinners together as couples to try to get to know one another better and understand each other and to see whether or not practicing law would be viable. And eventually, we learned that we had different perspectives about the practice of law. For Michael, law practice was ministry. For me at that time, my law practice was a tool to facilitate other ministry. And it took me a long time to come to understand and appreciate Michael's perspective. And it's really one of the first of many lessons that I learned from him to see work as ministry and to understand our calling is truly that, a vocation given to us by God. I ended up going in-house, and Michael often chided me for having sold out to corporate America as much as I chided him for being beholden to the billable hour. 
But we're deeply indebted to Michael and to Susan for their friendship in the ensuing years, their counsel about so many things, about parenting, about relationships, about the practice of law and serving clients, and about faith and ministry, of course, in a time of great change in the church. That's been shared over who knows how many lunches and dinners and potlucks, vacations together at Bablo in Minnesota and uh, Santa Fe together as well. And shared work on each other's cabins that always need work, as Michael and Susan knew so well. Well, I look back to that first meeting in the summer of 1985, and I'm astounded at the blessings that have flowed from Michael and Susan's friendship. And I'm filled with admiration for the lives that they have led and Susan continues to lead. I want to distill my tribute uh, briefly in, uh, to Mike into three realms, craftsmanship, community, and kingdom. Mike is a craftsman, as a lawyer, as a carpenter, as a gardener. And I watched him as a fellow lawyer, careful and thorough and wise and amazingly quick to understand what it was that the client, no matter how quirky, no matter from what realm of faith, wanted to accomplish. And Mike was pragmatic to know how to get that done. As a carpenter and as a gardener, Michael was creative. He was precise. His craftsmanship just shines in the many things that he built, pieces of furniture, for example. And he had a certain disregard for convention, um, could lead to unconventional but really beautiful outcomes from his craftsmanship. I remember um, showing him a piece of wood one time that is a leftover slat from an Ikea blind that I was going to toss. Michael looked at that and said, can I have those? And months later, Michael had produced a stunningly beautiful set of three shelves, which hang in our cabin today, crafted from Ikea blind slats that I was about ready to throw out. When I think of community, I think of how selfless Michael and Susan have been in building community, welcoming strangers and sojourners into their home with a good meal, with the gift of listening, with a warm bed. And many, many meals, joyous gatherings at 5934 West Midway Parkway, for which we're so grateful. And the many friendships that have come and flowed out of knowing Michael and Susan. And last, I think of the kingdom, this um, remarkable circle of friends that they have built, and clients from such a diverse group of people with dreams about ministry and creative ideas from so many walks of life and faith, welcomed loved without judgment, um, offered hospitality, counseled, often irrespective of their ability to pay legal fees, and infused with grace and truth and love. Michael and Susan, thank you so much for your gift of friendship, the wisdom that has come, the faith that you have walked so powerfully, and for the love that you have shown to Nancy and me. We love you and are grateful for your lives. Hi, I'm Rich Baker. I'm an attorney here in Chicago, practiced with Michael for many, many years. And Susan has asked me to share some of my memories. I'm limited in that my memories are primarily with regard to law and Michael was so much more than just a lawyer. But here goes. Michael was a mentor and a teacher par excellence. There was an enthusiasm that he had for teaching that was just infectious. And he was more than willing to share what he knew, but not only to share what he knew, but also to share what he had. So he would share documents or research or whatever you needed for the case that you were working on. I met Michael uh, in the late 70s I was a law student at Loyola and he was a young attorney. We were both members of Christian Legal Society and he took me alongside uh, and began mentoring me way back then. I remember at that time, Michael was a member of a Christian community in Austin and that he had a passion to demonstrate the gospel by sharing his legal skills uh, with the poor in Austin. So he, 
I think it was uh, Dan Van Ness, and then later uh, Jerry Nordgren and Barry Boykin uh, were involved in the Austin Community Legal Aid Clinic. I was very impressed uh, both by their zeal and by what they were doing, their care for the poor, that when I got out of law school, I began dedicating two days of my work week uh, to legal aid. But I learned something in that very quickly. Legal aid work is hard work. Because the problems that so many of the clients had were not just legal, but something much deeper. And so the legal issue was only the presenting problem. It was exhausting oftentimes to be working uh, in that situation. But Michael, Jerry and the others, they carried on. And when Michael finally transitioned into uh, the not-for-profit practice uh, that he developed, he carried with him many of the things that he had learned, including compassion for his clients and also being concerned with what they could and couldn't afford. Michael was very generous in his billing. The second thing I think about when I think of Michael is that he was a darn good not-for-profit attorney well-known in the community of Chicago with regard to his expertise. He taught not-for-profit at Northwestern and he uh, was involved in the continuing legal education seminars and wrote many articles with regard to not-for-profit. And we all use those in our research uh, when we were doing work for our clients. But Michael had more than just the knowledge. Michael had a way of practicing law, an attitude toward law which I've always valued very deeply. He was courageous, fearless actually. He was confident and he was also very um, creative. In those, I learned so much from him. I can remember uh, coming to him with a problem either with a uh, uh, IRS agent or with a um, Illinois Department of Revenue problem or whatever. And he was always uh, very, very willing, not only to help, but also energized to take on these bureaucrats. It was fun to be with him. And Michael's uh, approach was pretty aggressive, but he usually won. Michael was willing to take risks as well. Something that uh, I have not been as uh, aggressive as he is, but I've always appreciated it. Another thing that has to be said about Michael is that his clients loved him. I know this for a fact because when he came as, as of counsel with my firm, uh, and I took over many of his clients as he was retiring, they all spoke so highly of him. And they should have because he was fiercely um, loyal to them and fought for them. Michael was also loved by his staff. I think of uh, when he came to our office, one of the conditions was that we would take on a staff member of his that he was worried about in the transition. He made me promise that I would take care of his paralegal, Susan Thomas. The reality is he had trained her so well, it's she who really takes care of me. But there are two other things that I think of with Michael. First. Uh, he was fiercely independent. And secondly, Michael was uh, deeply uh, mindful of hypocrisy and he hated it. Uh, he was straightforward, but he was also um, kind. So I've run out of time. There's so much more I could say. Michael, thank you for your many, many years of mentoring and friendship. So, I'm Lara, Michael's daughter, and <clears throat> this summer the joke was I'm his only daughter because he sometimes had trouble remembering when I came in in my pajamas first thing in the morning. <laughs> And then I came in with my clothes on later that I wasn't another person. So there are many funny jokes this summer about which daughter I am. Um, and so that's just a funny thing for me. So I am currently sitting outside of my dad's cabin. 
of my parents' cabin, my family's cabin. And the reason that I'm doing this memorial video from here is because this is a place that I feel very, very close to my father. Um, he had his fingers on everything here. He designed everything. He built everything. He planned everything. And I can remember being eight years old and my parents talking and drawing pictures on napkins about what our house would look like, you know, if we got a summer house. You know, when we were back in the days of Beech Tree, thank you, Bergs. Um, and so I just felt like I wanted to say it right here. Um, I wrote a couple things down. Um, the reason that I think this cabin is so important is because it's such a very real thing of everything he believed in, everything he thought about, and everything that he loved. The design, the work, the carpentry. And as much as his law practice was amazing and the things that he did with nonprofit law and starting up other things, which make me so proud of him, being right here right now, it almost feels a little bit like I'm talking right to him. Um, so I just you know, want to say that when I come here, you know, he's put in the floors, he's put in the walls, he's put in the cabinets, he's put everything in, he's designed it, he built it at home in Chicago, and we drag it down here in our camper, in our trailer every year, and put things up together, um, and it's special. Um, things that I think about my dad that are so amazing that I will forever remember is that he was always such a support for me. Um, and he supported when I changed jobs. He supported when I became a teacher. He supported when I got married and had Zachary. Um, just amazing. Um, and so it's he's just been really amazing. I mean, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like I didn't drive him crazy many times because I did. But no matter what, I knew that he would always stand behind me and that I was a very, very, very lucky girl. Um, and so, you know, things about him, the leg was something, you know, him having one and a half legs was never even a thing for us. You know, we were raised right next to him while he took off the one leg and put it back on and all the different things he did. And how hard Keith and I practiced bringing coffee up the stairs on a Sunday morning or on a Saturday morning so that we could wrestle with him. You know, but until him and mom got their coffee, <laughs> we weren't gonna be able to play around with him. Um, and so, I mean, he was never a man with a disability as much as he had an arm that didn't open all the way and a leg and a half. He was so on top of everything. We were hiking. We were, he taught us how to ride our bicycles and he always stood behind us and helped to kind of support us through our choices, good or bad. Um, and so, I mean, Quite frankly, that's not an only my dad thing because my mom is amazing and he was very, very lucky to have her. Um, we all are. But, you know, I think just knowing that he would be there, he would be behind me holding my bicycle. And in my bedroom right now, there's a picture that I had put on Facebook shortly after he died where he and I are in a swimming pool and I'm probably about five or six years old and he's holding me up. You know, it's the beginning of me learning to swim and he's teaching me how to float on my back. And I think we were in California visiting um, my mother's parents. Um, but that for me is a very important thing because throughout my life I always knew that my dad had my back. And as much as I was like, you know, in the midst of doing my own naughty childhood things or, you know, going too far from the black block or breaking the rules, you know, whatever you do as a kid, um, I knew that my dad had my back and that he loved me very much and that I was very special to him. Um, I've always been impressed with his law practice. I had the pleasure and the privilege of working there for several months um, in between a semester of college while I was waiting to go and study abroad in Germany. And so I got to really see the firsthand direct workings in his law office and it was so cool to see all the things that he was involved in and see all the paperwork that they did and all the different churches and businesses that he was associated with and all the things that he did to really help those businesses to succeed um, and I just thought that that was amazing um, and so you know when I remember him being up here at the cabin will always be a place that's very close to my heart and I 
am reminding myself to take pictures now while I'm here um, so that it never goes away um, so that I have the pictures and so I just loved you very much daddy and I miss you and so that is my memorial for my father and I love him still and I'm enjoying being here because I'm talking to him daily <laughs> like last night when it was raining through the ceiling dad what do I do now so okay that's it thank you Child, I really love you, and I hope for you to know that the love I feel gives the way for you to grow.
My name is Keith Mosher, and Michael Mosher was my father. So much of who I am was shaped by him. I credit my father as the example and teacher for many of the foundational values I treasure in my life. Integrity, responsibility, love, joyful labor, curiosity, self-reliance. It's hard to credit my father in parenting without also acknowledging the partnership that he and my mother built together and how much effort and love both of them put into that partnership. It set so many of my expectations of how to be a man and a husband and a father Nothing is easy, but knowing what is worth working and sacrificing for is so important to me. My father had areas and depths that I did not know much about, but I can share my experience of him through the lens of my life, stories I remember of him, and especially what I think we shared and held in common. When I was a young child, I broke a neighbor's window while playing alone with no one around. I said nothing for days, and then tearfully confessed my crime to my dad. He was gentle and understanding. He walked with me to tell the neighbor, and offered to repair it, and then he helped me to fix it while teaching me how. It was a fundamental point in the development of my values and morals, and he showed me how to be who I wanted to be. On the harder side of character development, I tried wrestling in an early grade, and my father went to the first tournament with me. Halfway through, I had lost every match and felt upset and humiliated. I asked if I could quit and leave. My father calmly and gently told me that if I really wanted to, I could quit and we could leave, but that it is important to finish what you start, and he encouraged me to continue if I could. I did finish the tournament, and I lost the rest of the matches, and it was the right decision for me. Over time, I didn't get much unsolicited advice from my dad, but when he did share, he often handed me the piece that solved a puzzle I didn't realize I was struggling with. These pieces of advice have stayed with me and have always taken time and reflection for me to understand their depth. I believe he was a great observer of the world, and I think that he had a great insight into the workings of people. Two pieces of advice struck me in particular. He warned me as I started out on my own in the world that if I made money my goal, I would never have enough. Later, as he observed my struggles in romance, he encouraged me to look for people who had the same values as me. He told me that building a successful relationship depended on the two people having shared values, and the greater the difference in values, the more difficult it would be to build a strong relationship. One of my earliest warm memories that has stood the test of time was getting to go out to breakfast, just my dad and I at the diner around the corner. It's a powerful memory of great joy. As a father of two and one of three siblings, I now appreciate how chaotic and busy life is with small children. Both of my parents together worked hard to spend individual time with us, which was precious and incredibly valuable. My father and I shared a deep curiosity about the workings of the universe. At some point in my middle childhood, I traded bedtime stories for a chance to ask questions about everything in the universe that I could think to ask about. He patiently answered what he knew and speculated with me on the rest, fueling and spurring on the curiosity I shared with him. As I got older, I asked more questions about socializing, and I shared sad and bitter tears with him about the loneliness, isolation, and social failures of my awkward youth. He shared later how much he identified with me, and how difficult and painful it was for him to watch his child go through that without being able to help. But at the time, he just listened, rubbed my back, and accepted me. My father also added a great deal to my life with his creativity, ingenuity, and I suspect a childlike sense of joy and wonder. Throughout my childhood, Halloween was a high watermark of excitement, construction, and creativity. What do you want to be for Halloween? Turned into a process involving clever jokes, ingenious design, and involved construction. From a butterfly to a headless man to a malpractice lawyer, along with the creature from the Black Lagoon and a mummy who regrettably spent Halloween very sick with salmonella. Practical science was another area that I have great and glorious memories of my time with my dad. Science fair projects growing beans and dissolving metals and acids, building working motors, induction coils and solenoids, making batteries and wiring, soldering with solar panels. He was never one to sit around, and as I got older I'd spend time working with him on his projects or mine. 
I may have complained at the time, but thinking back, I have nothing but good memories of working with him. Later, he would visit my home, and there would always be a project we could do together to improve the place. So much, of my so much in my life was touched by him, and he's still very much in my daily existence. Little things remind me of him, a specific way of holding my arm up behind my head, which I smile at when I see my kids doing. Optimizing how I drive from place to place, sketching ideas on envelopes and notepads, folding tarps, expressions and turns of phrase I picked up from him. Some things are constant and in the background. Integrity, love, and self-reliance are ingrained in who I am, and I think of him when I consider who I am and why I value these things. Other parts stand out more often or more obviously. When I build or fix things, when I lean into hard work with delight, when I use a tool he gave me or taught me to use, I think of him. When I get flowers for my wife or touch and cultivate plants, I think of him. When I deal with the world and strive to choose integrity in my actions and forgiveness in my heart, I think of him. When I seek wisdom in parenting, when I hold my children in my arms, I think of him. As I think of my dad and what I can share about him with other people, I think I can best sum it up by saying, I hope in my life that I can be as good an influence on the world as he was, and as good a father to my children as he was to me. Thank you, Dad. I'm Susan Mosier. Michael and I met when we both transferred into Michigan State University, a school of 40,000. We met in statistics class, second try for both of us. In a class of 400, he miraculously recognized me by the back of my hair and came up after class to ask if we could study together. We got to know each other as friends during those study times, and from the beginning I saw him as a very real person not one to be treated lightly, someone who could be trusted, with whom I could be myself. He was obviously very intelligent, tenacious at his tasks, capable, and had a great sense of humor. He was grown up in a way that the other students weren't. I think his time in Vietnam and his training for that made some of the difference. When our friendship became a love relationship soon after our class ended, I remembered him one night bearing his heart and telling me, I have all this love inside like a furnace, and I've been waiting for the one person to share it with. I was privileged to be that person. Michael had a real spirit of adventure. For example, he spent two of his college summers on ships, one as waitstaff on a passenger ship on the Great Lakes, and the other on a tanker ship going between California and Hawaii. His experiences intrigued me. He had done so much, and he was only 23. He really seemed to know his way around the world, and I was impressed. Its adventurous spirit continued into our relationship and widened my world. My favorite memory was when we got into tent camping, and we took off in summer to go north to Alaska. We drove the old dirt Alaskan highway, stopping first at Yellowstone, Banff, and Jasper National Parks each location more beautiful than the last. He showed me the northern lights. We actually got jobs up in Alaska for the last few weeks of the summer. Thanks, Michael, for leading me in these adventures. Michael's curiosity was boundless, and he had an opinion about everything. His brain was a sponge, and he was like a walking encyclopedia. He loved to expound on any subject he had explored, from hinges on drawers to dinosaurs. One example of this was his nighttime ritual with his son, Keith, who often asked to exchange bedtime songs in favor of asking his dad questions like, how do engines work, dad? Michael loved to share his knowledge and share and taught his kids many things that he had taught himself. Because of our mutual love of nature, our kids grew up with camping from the time they could crawl through the dead ashes of the campfire. Michael would often lead us on hikes, playing Daniel Boone, the guide choosing the way. Our kids remember Michael's comic side as he would burst into song on a steep cliff of starved rock, singing a made-up song about, Poor Timothy Mouths, he's dead and gone. He got too close to the edge and he fell. Or dramatically shout, P.I., 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 as we came across patches of poison ivy. 
Michael's love of the outdoors and his awe of God's beautiful creation, his love of growing things, was picked up by all three of our kids in, his, in their own ways, one of the gifts that he gave them. After we met, Michael became curious about Christianity, having had no training in Christianity or any religion when he was growing up. His main takeaway of Christianity was the Crusades. When we first began our relationship, he knew that I was a believer in Jesus and I was struggling with many of my faith questions. We had honest, lively dialogues about spirituality, faith, and Jesus. His curiosity became engaged. He began to read books like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Michael used to say that God used my years away from God to draw him into the faith. When we got married, we included communion for the two of us in our very personalized wedding ceremony as a sign of our faith that we wanted to include God as a third strand in the bond of our marriage. God honored that, moving us to Chicago for law school, wooing us to Circle Church, which was pastored by David Maines, where a few weeks later I returned to my faith and Michael surrendered his heart to God. Michael soon used his wacky sense of humor and clever mind as part of the team of teachers in the Circle Learning Center, a creative Sunday school program led by Pastor Jim Westgate at Circle Church. Can you just see Michael dressed up as Professor Tinkett with a long robe and funny hats and quite an accent, acting out gospel truths for the kids in a Sesame Street manner? Jim Westgate was a real mentor for Michael, and over the years they worked together, Michael grew in his faith. When we lived in Austin with the Austin Community Fellowship, Michael got involved in teaching the kids of the neighborhood skills like fixing bikes as means of a building a relationship with them. One young man, ironically named Austin, years later came home from college and sought Michael out. You made a big difference in my life, he told him. You believed in me. You hung in there with me. And it went a long ways towards teaching me to respect and believe in myself. Michael's faith found its most profound outlet in his calling to be an attorney as his way of forwarding kingdom values. His contrarian nature, the same nature that led him to spurn blue jeans and believe as Frank Sinatra sang, I'll do it my way, led him to build his own firm and choose a less popular area for practice, the not-for-profit world. Ryan Oberly, one of the young attorneys he mentored, sent this tribute to Michael in the last days of his illness. Michael was an incredible mentor and teacher to me of law, life, and what it meant to care for the least of these. He was a trailblazer in the practice of law, developing a niche to serve the nonprofit sector in a way that few had previously done. He lived out the gospel so well in the way he practiced law and had such a tremendous heart for sharing that passion and teaching others what he had learned. In many ways, he was like a father to me. He taught me to learn something new every day, how to love your clients, your co-workers, and your plants well. And he was so great at teaching, being patient and asking just the right question to make you think. I think about him often, his legacy, and how thankful I am for what he did for me. Michael's life revolved around his family. He loved us all so much. He loved us in the ways he knew how and he stretched himself to love us in ways we needed to love we needed him to love us he created a beautiful oak cradle to welcome our first child into the world that project reflected a lot of his character jane lambshed wrote a note describing so much of what was precious about his creativity i admired the evidence of michael's precise careful workmanship in what he created especially in the cradle in which all of your children slept my admiration of the cradle he built is not just of the lovely and practical piece of furniture it is. It includes the whole long process, the way he turned junk wood into something so fine. He saw the potential in the wood, discarded from a demolished building. After gathering enough pieces and designing the cradle, he had to do the work of restoring that wood before he could start building it. These are small examples of Michael's persistent and skillful dedication to worthy goals he set for himself. Michael was our go-to parent for costumes for Halloween. Had to be homemade. Headless Man was a winner, as was Butterfly. 
Birthday parties were filled with creative games that Michael configured, like water balloons thrown from the balcony to try to hit a homemade clown's mouth. He handled all the games and entertainment. I saw there was food and treats. One fond memory I have of his dedication to his kids was watching this man, who had limitations in walking, practically running behind his kids' bikes as he taught them how to ride. Michael was an involved father. He was home for supper every night and nightly helped me put the kids to bed with stories, songs, and prayers. And, for those who wanted it, talking time. He volunteered with scouts with the boys and took his daughter to classes at the art museum when she was just three or four. These are some of his ways of expressing his love. Sunday morning was the time of three against dad, roughhousing in the family bed with much glee and laughter. When we acquired family property on an island in the Straits of Michigan, Boblo to the natives, we had the shell of a house built then we all worked together to complete the inside of the cabin from insulation onward. Michael led the team in his dream to get it built using both his skills and his creativity. There was often moaning and groaning of too much time with too hard work, but those times created memories for the kids, the experience of watching the house appear before their eyes as each project was finished. A bit of each of our souls is a part of that island retreat. That's where Michael's ashes will be scattered. He loved that land, that creative playground, that beautiful, natural, untamed land, and wanted to become a part of the spirit of the lake. These are my personal glimpses. Creative, clever, curious, compassionate, capable, contrarian, and constant. I'm grateful for the love of this man, and I give thanks for the love and many experiences in life which he brought to me and to our family. How Can I Keep From Singing was one of my dad's favorite songs. Uh, I think he liked the idea that there was a, um, a sound that was always being sung in the background. And there's a, a constant presence or a, a, a movement of uh, something holy. And um, he also really liked the, the verse about the tyrants trembling, sick with fear. And um, yeah, I think that, that was a, sort of an important part of his life. Um, yeah, he wanted this play that is, you know, he told me. So there it is. Since Christ. 
Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? Tyrants tremble, sick with fear, and hear their death bells are ringing. Friends rejoice, afar and near. How can I keep from singing? In prison cells. Thoughts to them are winning when friends by shame are defiled. How can I keep from singing? Since I first learned to love it, peace of Christ makes fresh my heart. The fountain ever springing, all things are I heard about Mike Mosier long before I actually met him. It seemed like everyone in my world, the world of small nonprofit enterprises and kind of modest sized efforts who were trying to make a difference, somehow we had all benefited by Michael. He had a knack, I was told, for working efficiently and confidently. He was a person, I was told, who could take your idea, your hope, your hunch, and put some heft to it. Arrange your bylaws, organize your paperwork. Mike Mosier, I was told, could erect the foundation and he could build the walls that would not only shelter and protect your good instincts, but also give them a chance to take off, give them a way that they could be nourished as you started to grow, to take root, to expand. Several years later, I found myself walking down LaSalle as Mike and I searched for an uncrowded lunch spot. We talked about his family's days at Circle Church, which super cool church right then and now, and just how the reality of community, though, never seemed to be as beautiful as our fantasy of it. We evaluated the then director of the Chicago Housing Authority, Vincent Lane, remember him, some of you guys? And the proposed teardown of Cabrini Green Housing where various church members lived and various friends of his lived. We talked about the Vietnam War and the lingering pain of his hip and the fact that we always have to question authority. We laughed at life's mortality rate Still 100%. <laughs> and then we got down to business. 
just how could we amend our bylaws so LaSalle Street Church and its board could function more effectively? Hmm. I left thinking, wow, he's a good man, doing good work, kind, dependable, consistent. Later, I would add ruthlessly honest to that assessment. Michael refused to pretend to believe something that wasn't validated by his own experience. He examined assumptions. He saw the world with a fundamental curiosity that kept him ever expanding. Mike was not content with simple answers or any kind of pat dogma. Faith at its best is that little piece of us that keeps aching for more. It's that glimpse of goodness or love or of beauty, right? That, that, that keeps asking this question, what's behind this? Faith is that restlessness that dives headlong into mystery, seeking to apprehend the source. Michael never reduced the complex world. So filled with wonder and surprise, he never reduced that to small answers. And for that, I had so much respect. I remember reading that when the late Cardinal Bernadine was dying, the Cardinal said that his sadness about death was balanced by his curiosity about what's next. There's so much I want to know. The Cardinal said, seeing Mike just weeks before he died, I suspect he had that similar instinct. We see through it last dimly, St. Paul wrote, but one day we will see it all face to face. Michael has had that chance, that opportunity. So will you and I, because mortality is still at 100%. Funerals, all of them, including this one today, they are for the living, aren't they? They're moments when we stop and we grieve and we honor, we remember, and then we go on. We go on living. We close our laptops from this service. We wipe away the tears and we get busy fixing dinner <laughs> or finishing an assignment or drawing a bath. The business of life calls out to us to get on with it. But a good funeral for a good person can leave a mark on us. And that's what we really long for. That's what Susan hoped for when she was putting this together and family and friends offered their various contributions. She wanted a way of not just remembering Michael, but honoring life itself, his life and your life and the contribution you make to it. Today, may each of us who knew Mike Mosier be encouraged. May we be strengthened by the example he left behind. May we indeed call him to mind in the way that scripture repeatedly invites people to call to mind those who came before and the deeds that they did. But not just in the way of venerating or putting it on the shelf but in a way of strengthening the work that you have for today. The good work that you might put your hands and your hearts to today. That's what Jesus keeps inviting of his people. And that's what this great community of saints all around us, in fact, will celebrate All Saints Day tomorrow on Sunday. They invite us to remember them as a way of living life well. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we are grateful for Mike and we're grateful for all these people 
who have shared from the heart and so beautifully. And we ask that today, these remembrances, these sharings, these scripture texts that we love, these familiar stories that we embrace, that they would all be a call to live and to live well. We thank you that you give us so many gifts that outlast us, but the greatest of these gifts is love. And so is Michael's love for his family and love for this place and love for this world and love for the poor and love for those people who are doing good work all over this city. As that is brought to our minds today, we ask, may that same love be poured out into us. We ask all this, Jesus, in your name, and we all say, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear now the benediction. Death will come. Its hand will not be stayed even an instant. Nor can we enter into judgment with it. Our question, why? will go unanswered. But this does not mean that we are helpless in the face of death. We can and we do rob death of ultimate victory by living life as long as it is ours to live. To ask of death that it never come is futile. But it is not futility to pray that when death comes for us, it may take us from a world, one corner of which is a little better because we were there. When we are dead and people weep for us and grieve, let it be because we touch their lives with beauty and simplicity. Let it not be said that life was good to us, but rather that we were good to life. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, receive as you have the soul of Michael Mosier and receive our grief at the loss of him here in this world. And receive him with joy into your kingdom triumphant, the kingdom that has no end. And may these words, these words of Rabbi Jacob Rubin, it was so true of Mike Mosier that he left the world, a corner of which was better because he was there. May that word, that sentiment be true of us, the living as well. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your walk among us. And we thank you for the certainty that there is life and there is death and there is life again. All praise and glory to your name alone. And let all God's people say, Amen.
And your f- 